The principal of a junior high school was having a problem with a few of the older girls who were just starting to use lipstick. When applying it in the bathroom, they would then press their lips to the mirror and leave lip prints all over it. The principal tried to convince them to stop making such a mess on the school's bathroom mirrors, but the girls did it all the more. It was obvious they were not motivated out of any regard for the principal or school property. <laughs> but before it got too far out of hand, the principal suddenly came up with an idea. He gathered all the girls together in the ladies' room and told them to meet at 2 p.m. And when they all gathered together, they found the principal and the school custodian waiting for them. The principal again explained to the girls, listen, it was really becoming a problem for the custodian to have to clean these mirrors every single night. He said he felt the ladies did not fully understand just how much a problem it was. And so he wanted them to witness firsthand how hard it was to clean those mirrors. And the custodian basically did a demonstration. He took a long brush with a handle out of a box. He then proceeded to dip the brush into the nearest toilet. He moved to the mirror and then he proceeded to use the brush to remove all the lipstick. That was the last day the girls ever pressed their lips on that mirror. You know, it's amazing to me what it takes sometimes to motivate us to do the right thing. What is it that motivates you? What is it that will push you in the right direction? I know in my own life sometimes it's fear. The fear of getting a traffic ticket, for example, might keep me under the 80 mile, mile an hour speed limit. Uh, sometimes it's guilt that motivates us. Uh, a Catholic friend of mine said he learned early on that a little guilt goes a long ways. Sometimes guilt motivates us. Sometimes it's pain. Somebody said the only lessons we really learn are the painful ones. They're branded into our brain. Sometimes it's love that motivates us. Sometimes it's just the, the inner satisfaction of knowing you did the right thing. What is it that really motivates us? What is it that, that if we're going in one direction, what is it that, that, that turns us around and, and causes us to go in the other direction? What is it that makes us turn around? What will God have to do sometimes to... Well, stop us from continuing to do what he knows is harmful or destructive to us. I want to look at two major questions this morning. Two questions that haunt a lot of people today and haunted me when I was a, a new believer. And the first question is this. Is there really a heaven and is there really a hell? And secondly, if there really is a heaven and there really is a hell, is heaven our default destination? Or is it hell? In other words, by default, where do people automatically go when they die? Heaven or, or hell? A few years ago, the Los Angeles Times did an interesting survey of what Americans really believe about heaven and hell. And it showed that for every American who believes he's going to hell, there are 120 who believe they're going to heaven. In other words, the vast majority of people today really believe by default they're automatically going to make it to heaven. Why? Because they're basically good people. They deserve it. You know, for the past 40 years, all the different memorial services and funerals I've done, never once, not once, have I ever heard anyone refer to the dearly departed as being in hell. <laughs> never. That's never happened. Instead, you'll usually hear someone say, well, we're going to miss old Sam but he's in a better place now. Or, I'm so glad Aunt Betty is no longer suffering. She's now resting in eternal peace. And everyone nods in agreement. But how do we really know that? What gives us the confidence and maybe the audacity to make a declaration of that? What is our default destination? Is it heaven or is it hell? You know, the optimism of most people stands in stark contrast to what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 7 when he said this, Enter through the narrow gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the road that leads to destruction, and many enter through it. But small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life, and only a few find it. 
The analogy here is that everybody is going through one of two gates in this life. The one gate is wide with basically an eight-lane freeway going through the middle of it. Most people will take this route, Jesus said. It's easy. It's popular. It's the, the path of least resistance. It's the way everybody's going. Do whatever you want to do. But as Jesus tells us, it also leads to death and destruction. And so the wide gate is the bad way to go. <laughs> the other gate, Jesus said, is small and it's narrow. It's not so easy. It's unpopular. It's the road less traveled. It's the path of obedience. And Jesus tells us the only path, this is the only path that leads to life. This is the only path that leads to the kingdom of God. If this tells us anything, it tells us that true followers of Jesus Christ will always be in the minority, in the small minority. Now, I don't say that with any exclusive glee. I don't see, say that with any spiritual elitism. I share that because Jesus stated that as a sober reality. Most people are not going to follow Jesus. Jesus is implying that most of the world around us is quite literally going the other direction. Why is that? Because they choose to. So what is the universal problem that would keep most people out of heaven? The Bible tells us it's a three-letter word, sin. It has separated us from that relationship we are to have with God. Isaiah 59, 2 goes on to point out, but your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you. You see, the problem is that most people today don't think they have a major sin problem, or at least not one that would send them to hell. <laughs> I was talking to a guy a couple of years ago. He told me he really wasn't worried about the afterlife. He said, because I'm a, I'm a pretty good guy. I asked him, well, so what's your, what's your definition of good? He said, I don't know, I'm good. <laughs> I told him that the Bible's definition of good is measuring up to and keeping and maintaining the Ten Commandments. Have you done that? And he said, yeah, I think so. I said, well, there's commandment number you shall not bear false witness. Have you ever lied? Ever told a white lie or a fib? That counts. He says, yeah, I guess so, I've lied. What about commandment number eight, you shall not steal. Have you ever stolen anything? Cheating on your taxes, cheating on a test, that's, that's stealing. He said, okay, I guess I've stolen a few things. What about commandment number seven, you shall not commit adultery. Have you ever committed adultery? And he said, no. Jesus said, if you look upon a woman to lust after her, you've already committed adultery in your heart. Have you ever looked at anyone with lust? He said, yeah, I guess so then you're an adulterer, right? What about commandment number six? You should not commit murder. Have you ever killed anybody? He said, no. Jesus said, if you hate someone, if you've ever called somebody a fool, you're guilty of murder. What about the commandment number three? You shall not take, take the Lord's name in vain. Have you ever used the creator's name as a swear word? God, Jesus, Lord, Christ. Have you ever used it in vain? That's called blasphemy. God hates blasphemy. In fact, if you have broken these commandments at any time, then by your own admission, I said to him, you're a blasphemer, a murderer, a liar, and a thief, and an adulterer. And we only looked at the first five of the, of the Ten Commandments. Well, here's the kicker. James 2.10 points out that whoever keeps the whole law, all ten of them, and yet stumbles at one point, he's guilty of them all. So the Bible says if you've broken even one commandment, you're guilty of them all. Which makes us all, every one of us, adulterers, murderers, thieves, and liars, and blasphemers. <laughs> Some are just more active than others. Romans 3.10 says there is none righteous, no, not one. So if you're going to go by God's measurement of, of, of goodness, listen, nobody qualifies. Nobody. Nobody's good enough. Why is that? Because God is holy. He's perfect. He's transcendent. He cannot allow sin in any way, shape, or form to be in his presence. The prophet Habakkuk describes the Lord when he says, Your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. You cannot tolerate wrong. In fact, because we are all sinners, we're not even remotely entitled to enter into and abide in God's presence. We just can't do it. And so it is absolutely impossible to enter into heaven as we are. Why? Because the consequences of being lost is far deeper and more terrible than you and I could possibly imagine. 
What are the consequences of sin and lostness? Well, the Bible declares that we are sentenced physical to physical and spiritual death. We are separated from God. We are dominated and controlled by sin. We're spiritually blind. We're without understanding. We're enemies of Christ. We're object of God's wrath, and we're considered children of the devil. And that's on a good day. <laughs> In fact, the Bible describes mankind's lostness as the most pitiful condition imaginable. Not only is, it, is our life on earth wasted as we live it for self and selfish reasons, but the consequences is eternal separation from God. And so heaven is obviously not our default destination. Not a single one of us goes there automatically. Why? Because we have a sin problem. Unless that's resolved, the only other place left for us to go that natural default destination is hell itself. And so, because, uh, you know, and, and really the greatest, I think the greatest danger today is for people to assume that they're heading for heaven when Jesus made it crystal clear that most people are not going that direction. Small is the gate and narrow the road that leads to life and only a few find it. Jesus later states in John 14, 6, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. The History Channel a few years ago had an interesting uh, documentary and told about how dozens of people have attempted to go over Niagara Falls in the past 150 years in everything from a barrel to patting themselves with, with foam rubber. The mighty, the mighty Niagara River plummets 180 feet at both the American and Horseshoe Falls. Some of you have been there. But nearly everyone who's taken that ride has not survived. Right before you come to the falls, there is violent and turbulent white water. Caught in that vicious, those vicious rapids means certain death. However, further upstream, the river's current is more gentle and you can navigate it with a boat. But posted on a bridge's pylon, about a half a mile up from the edge of the falls, there's a huge warning sign. And it says this, do you have an anchor? And then right beneath the words are this, is this question, do you know how to use it? You see, truth is our anchor. It is something that is absolutely critical for us to, to have and to use to avoid disaster, to avoid, avoid certain death. As you well know, we live in a day and age where truth is up for grabs. Everything is relevant, and surveys show that most people today reject any notion of absolute truth. There's no anchor. And so people just drift with the current, wherever it takes them. The Bible tells us that our anchor and the central piece of our spiritual armor that holds everything else in place is what is called the belt of truth. The belt of truth is the very word of God. Truth is our anchor, and without it, we perish. In his priestly prayer for us, Jesus requested that the Father would sanctify us, that is, his disciples, sanctify them in the truth. Your word, he says, is, is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. It was Sunday night, October 8th, 1871. The great evangelist D.L. Moody was preaching in Chicago to a packed auditorium. But during the service, the, the city was quickly burning down. Moody was asking those present that evening to evaluate their own relationship to Jesus Christ and to make a decision to make him Lord and Savior of their lives. But with the loud sirens of fire trucks racing outside and the clanging of church bells, Moody had to dismiss the crowd, but he invited them to come back the following week in order to make that decision. But for many, that decision would be too late. In the next 24 hours, what would become known as the Great Chicago Fire burned down practically the entire city and killed hundreds and hundreds of people. D.L. Moody made a promise to himself right then and there that he would never again close out any service without pleading to make a decision now. Why? 2 Corinthians uh, 6 2 declares, Now is the day of salvation. Why? Because you don't have tomorrow. James 4 14 tells us why you do not even know what will happen tomorrow. What is your life? You are a mist that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. 
Now, there's no way that we can take a wait-and-see attitude when it comes to finding out what's on the other side of death. If you don't know Christ, it is not safe to die. We've talked about that a couple of weeks ago. You can't just cross your fingers and, and hope that our names are maybe written in the book of life. We can know and we should know that before we die, we know exactly where we're going. Do you have the assurance of your salvation? Why? Because you could die at any moment. I'm not trying to scare anybody. But we're all just one heartbeat away from eternity. It reminds me of the rich man in Luke chapter 12 who was talking to himself. He was talking to himself. Maybe he was looking in a mirror. I don't know. And I will say to my soul, soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him, you fool, this very night your soul is required of you. And now who will own what you have prepared? And Jesus adds, so is the man who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. So we desperately, we really do, we desperately need to know now, not tomorrow, not next month, not next year, Joshua 24, 15 says, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. Do you have the assurance of your salvation? I think most of you do. Some of you might think, well, I hope so. I think so. God wants to, you to know so. <laughs> you know, somebody rightly called hell the heaven's awful alternative. We talked about hell a couple of weeks ago. I got a, call, a couple of calls this week from people that said, you're not going to talk about hell again Sunday, are you? <laughs> I said three parts, this is the third part, please still come to church. You know, <laughs> I don't always talk about hell, but the Bible tells us that hell is inhabited by those who in this life have chosen not to embrace or receive God's gift of redemption in Christ Jesus. 1 John 1, 12 says, but as many as receive him, to them he gives the right to become the children of God. We need to receive that gift. A gift is not a gift unless you take it, embrace it, surrender yourself to it. In Revelation 20, the Apostle John got a sneak preview of what is to come as far as Judgment Day. God gave John a vision of that final day of judgment that's going to take place and what that's going to look like. In John chapter 20, verse 11, is a glimpse of that future and final judgment. John says, I saw a great white throne and whom, him who sat upon it, from whose presence earth and heaven fled away, and no place was found for them. I saw the dead and the great and the small standing before the throne, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged from the things which were written in the books according to their deeds. Unbelievers will be exposed and judged according to their deeds. Now, I want you to imagine, putting up on the big screen here, your top 10 grossest things that you've ever done in your life. Just we'll list them right up there for everybody to see. Or, or, or maybe even the top 10 worst things you've even thought of. That kind of exposure in the light of God's holy judgment is what awaits every unbeliever. Not Christian, but unbeliever. Exposed and judged according to their deeds. And all of their deeds are evil. All their deeds include sin. Even the good deeds include sin. J. Vernon McGee once pointed out, for the unregenerate person to be removed from the very presence of God on judgment day and cast into outer darkness for all of eternity would be far more tolerable than for that same person stained with all his unforgiven sin to stand for even a moment in the terrifying holiness and unapproachable light of the very presence of Almighty God. That's why to be cast into hell will both be a punishment but also a mercy. God dwells in unapproachable light. And the sober realization is the fact that we will all be judged by that standard or, or, or light of God's perfection and majesty and power and holiness and glory and splendor. Praise the Lord for the person and work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross who paid for all of our sin. First, uh, first uh, Peter 2.9 declares that a believer who's trusted in Christ as their Lord and Savior this declaration is made. You are a chosen race. Praise God for that. You are a royal priesthood. You are a holy nation. A people for God's own possession. So that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. 
For you once were not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Praise the Lord for that. You see, it will be after Christ's glorious return that John chapter 5 tells us there will be a resurrection. A resurrection of believers to eternal life in heaven and a resurrection of unbelievers for eternal existence in hell. In other words, the Bible says that everyone is going to be resurrected someday. Everyone who ever lived is created to live forever. But it's like the bumper sticker I told you about once that says everybody goes to God. It's where he sends you afterwards that counts. It's all about location, location, location. And so again, everyone gets resurrected from the dead. The unsaved, everyone whose name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life will be resurrected and judged by God according to their works, which they have done, recorded somehow in God's ledger. But the Bible is crystal clear that we are not saved by works. We know that, right? Why? Because those works include sin. I don't care what your motivation might be. And people on their own without Christ can never enter the presence of a holy, just, and righteous God, no matter how good their works are. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not as a result of works that no one should boast. Nobody's ever going to be able to stand before God someday and go, I got here because I was such a swell guy. None of us, no matter how good we think our good works have been. Titus 3, 5 says, He saved us not on the basis of deeds which we have done in righteousness, but according to his mercy. His mercy by the washing of regeneration and renewing by the Holy Spirit. And so without that washing of regeneration, without that renewing of the Holy Spirit, Jesus says in Matthew chapter 13 that that person will be consigned to a place of everlasting destruction. In fact, Christ will someday say to those who are not covered by the payment that he made on that cross, he will say to them, depart from me, you who are cursed into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. And so hell, is, <laughs> hell will not at all be like what's often portrayed on TV or in the comic books, like a big gigantic party where everybody's drinking and, and telling war stories about their escapades back on earth. It's not going to be like that. Instead, Jesus tells us that it will be a place of utter misery. It'll be a place of conscious torment. It'll be a place with no hope and no relief. I shared the story before about Charlie Peace. Charlie Peace was a criminal back in the 1800s. He was hung for his crimes in London on July 4th, 1854. The story goes like this, that Charlie Price was marched to the gallows. A priest followed reading these words from the prayer group, or the prayer book. Those who die without Christ experience hell, which is the pain of forever dying without the release with which death itself can bring. When those chilling words were read, Charlie Price stopped in his tracks. He turned to the priest and he said, do you really believe that? I mean, really, do you believe that? The priest was taken back by this verbal assault. He stammered and he said, well, yeah, I guess so. Well, I don't, said Charlie. But if I did... I'd get down on my hands and knees and crawl all over Great Britain, even if it were paved with pieces of broken glass, if I could rescue just one person from what you just told me. One pastor writes this, It's so easy for us to talk about people going to hell. But if in the depths of our being we really believe this, we should constantly be witnessing, sharing our faith, because the thought of people going to hell without having heard about Christ should be an intolerable, intolerable burden to bear. It really should. Jesus warns us that do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul, but rather, rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. You know, as born-again believers, we have to see our work, we have to see our service, our time here on earth as a calling. We're here for a reason. We're here to, to serve and to obey the Lord, both out of a sense of, of love, but also out of a, a sense of holy fear, fear and maybe, maybe even terror. But it's not a fear that God will destroy us. We're, we're safe. We are his children. Uh, Christ died for us. We're safe in the Father's hand, as it says in John chapter 10. Uh, no man is able to snatch us out of his hand. But we are to have a healthy fear of God's 
ability to destroy the, the, the body and souls of those around us who don't know him. In fact, that was a key part of the Apostle Paul's motivation. He said, therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. Knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade men. So the big question is, do we really believe that people around us who don't know the Lord are lost forever? Do we really believe that? Do we really understand the reality of the ultimate judgment and hell itself? Jesus tells us here that if a person is going to be afraid, hey, listen, don't be afraid of the person that can just kill your body. That's temporary. But rather, he says, be afraid of what the Lord is able to do. He has the ultimate power to destroy both soul and body in hell, and that's eternal. You know, the reality of, of hell should break our hearts. It should take us to our knees every day, and maybe to the doors of those without Christ. And yet, even among Bible Believers, hell has rare, hell's kind of become the H word. We don't want to talk about it. We don't want to refer to it. The problem today and the common attitude today is to, to deny or to ignore the clear teachings of what the scriptures say about this horrible place. Why is that? Do you know that, that Jesus spoke seven times more about hell than he did about heaven? He spoke, spoke eight times more about hell than he did about love. Why? Jesus actually talks more about hell than any other character in the, in the entire Bible, including any Old Testament prophet. And so as Randy Alcorn points out, it is in fact arrogant that we as creatures would dare to take that what we think is the moral high ground in opposition to what God the Creator has clearly revealed. And so what's the real reason? Why is it that so many resist and, and reject this whole idea of hell? I mean, it's not a popular subject, right? I think it's because if they really believed or understood that other people deserved hell, they would have to come to the realization that they themselves do as well. And so let's just deny it. Let's just not believe it. Let's just reject it. Let's forget about it. In the words of the Isaiah, uh, prophet Isaiah, we would come to that awful realization in Isaiah 64, 6, for all of us have become like one who is unclean, all of us. And all our righteous deeds are like a filthy garment. And all of us wither like a leaf, and all our iniquities like the wind take us away. You see, if we really understood God's nature, if we really understood our sinful condition, I think we would, be, we, we would actually be shocked. Not that people would be in hell, but that anyone would make it to heaven. Unholy as we are, we are disqualified from, from saying that infinite holiness doesn't demand everlasting punishment. In fact, by denying the existence of hell, we are minimizing Christ's work on the cross. We really are. I mean, if there's no hell then why in the world did Jesus have to die such a horrible death on a cross? Why would he have to go through that? What did he save us from? He didn't save us from ourselves. Alcorn puts it this way, if Christ's crucifixion and resurrection didn't deliver us from an eternal hell, his work on the cross is less heroic, less potent, less consequential, and less deserving of our worship and praise. It minimizes what Christ has done on the cross. Theologian William T. Uh, G. T. Shedd says this, The doctrine of Christ's vicarious atonement logically stands or falls with that of eternal punishment. In other words, if there's no hell, then there's no heaven. When you read through the Gospels, you'll discover that although Jesus approached people positively, he really did. He offered healing, he offered forgiveness, he offered love, he offered, offered compassion. But he also made it crystal clear that in the end, sin reaps a horrible harvest. And so it's obvious from the biblical record that Jesus desperately wants us to understand the reality of this place called hell. Why? As a huge warning to keep us from going there. In fact, he warns us about it time and time and time again. And so what does Jesus say about hell? Well, we talked about it a few weeks ago. He refers to it as a literal place. It's described in graphic terms, a raging fire, eternal decay. Christ says the unsaved will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Last week we looked at the rich man and Lazarus. 
And Jesus taught in that parable, or that, actually that little story, that in hell the wicked will suffer terribly. They are fully conscious. They retur- retain their desires. They retain their, their, their memories, their reasoning. They long for relief. They cannot be comforted. They, they cannot leave their, their torment. They are without hope. Our Savior could not have painted a more explicitly bleak and and graphic picture. 2 Corinthians describes those who die without Christ, they will be punished with everlasting destruction and shed out from the presence of the Lord and from the majesty of his power. I have to be really honest this morning. I, uh, I hate the very idea that people I know will end up in hell. Trust me. I I don't want to believe in it. I hate the thought as much as you do. I do. But if I make what I want and what others want to be the basis of of my beliefs, then I'm a follower of myself and my culture rather than a follower of Jesus. Novelist Dorothy Sayers writes this. She says, there seems to be kind of a conspiracy to forget or to conceal where the doctrine of hell comes from. She writes, the doctrine of hell is not for frightening people into giving more money to the church. It is Christ's deliberate judgment on sin. We cannot repudiate hell without altogether repudiating Christ. C.S. Lewis says basically the same thing. He writes this in The Problem of Pain. There is no doctrine which which I would more willingly remove from Christianity than this. If it isn't lay in my power, he says. But it has the full support of scripture and especially of our Lord's own words. It has always been held true by true Christianity. It has also the support of reason. So let me ask you this this morning. Is it unloving to talk about hell (laughs) with someone? Is that unloving? Let me illustrate. If you were uh, giving some friends directions to Denver, and you knew that one road led there, but a second road ended up at a sharp cliff around a blind corner, would you only talk about the safe road? No. You would tell them about both roads, especially if you knew that the road to destruction was wider and more more traveled. In fact, it would be terribly unloving not to warn them about the other road. For the same reason, it is not at all unloving to tell people about the reality of hell. In fact, the most basic truth is that there's only two possible locations to go after death, heaven or hell. Each is just as real. Each is just as eternal. And then unless and until we surrender our lives to Jesus Christ, by default, we are headed to destruction. And so I think the most loving thing we can do for our friends and for our family is to warn them, not to beat them over the head of the Bible, but just to simply warn them, do you know where you're going to go after you die? Do you know that heaven is not your default destination? We need to warn them about the road that leads to destruction and also the road that leads them to eternal life. Years ago, a friend of mine was having heart problems. And uh, his doctor recommended a, a procedure to remedy the heart problem that he had. The doctor was trying to be real diplomatic with my friend. He said, you know, this is probably a good thing to do. It's, it's a wise thing to go ahead and have this procedure done. I think it would really help the problem. My friend wasn't convinced. He thought, I I really don't know if I want to go through with this. His wife told me later that when the doctor left the room, this battle axe of a nurse came into the room. And she pointed her finger in his face and she said, look, if you don't get this operation, you're going to drop dead of a heart attack in the middle of the street. Is that what you want? Get it done. (laughs) He got the operation. (laughs) So what's worse? A, a, a doctor lovingly tell us, telling me not to worry about that, that fatal uh, cancer that I might have. Or a doctor lovingly confront us, confronting me with the fact that if I don't eradicate that cancer, I'm going to die. I want to hear the bad news. <laughs> I do. So why is it that we're not telling others? Why aren't we telling our friends and our family about the cancer of sin and evil and how to uh, avoid the penalty of eternal destruction? You know, I, if we really understood the reality of hell, even in the slightest, none of us would ever tell someone, go to hell. None of us would ever say that. In fact, the fact of the matter is, is it's far too easy to, to go to hell. 
As one author put it, going to hell requires no change of course, no navigational adjustment. We were born with our autopilot set toward hell, but it is not to be taken lightly. Hell is the single greatest tragedy in the universe. Wow. Men and women, God loves us enough to tell us the truth. There are two, there are two eternal destinations, not one. We must choose the right path if we're going to go to heaven. All roads do not lead to heaven. Only one does. And that's through the Lord Jesus Christ. And he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one except through me. All other roads lead to hell. Now, we cannot talk about heaven without talking about hell. And we pointed out last week that the best, the, the, the best of life here on earth... The best thing you could possibly experience here on earth is, is just a glimpse, just a taste of heaven. And the worst thing in this world is just a taste, just a glimpse of hell. And so if you're a Christian this morning, this present life is as close to hell as you'll ever get. It gets better after this life, trust me. If you're an unbeliever this morning, this life is as close to heaven as you'll ever get. This is as good as it gets. What a tragedy. The reality of the choice that lies before us is both wonderful and awful. Those of us who have trusted Christ as our Savior should get down on our knees every day and thank him and praise him for taking us out of that horrible condition of sin and death. And so all of this is to prompt us to a spirit of gratitude. Most of the people you, you meet every day are lost. Most of the people you meet every day are, are in desperate need of a Savior. The people you work with, the neighbors you have, certain family and friends. Why? God is holy. We are sinful. God is just. We break his commandments every single day in thought, word, and deed. God is holy and just. He cannot say, you know, I feel benevolent today. You know, we'll let that one go. Let's just pretend it never happened. I'll let this one slide. I'll let you off just for good behavior. Why can't he do that? Because he is holy, he is just, he is perfect. And this holy God loves us. He wants us to bring us into a right relationship with himself. A few years ago, I saw a sign for a lost dog. There's this big cash reward for whoever found this lost dog, along with the description of the dog. This is what the sign said. He's only got three legs. He's blind in the left eye, he's missing a right ear, and his tail is broken off. He was neutered accidentally by a fence, ouch. He's, al he mo he's almost deaf, and he goes by the name Lucky. <laughs> now some would argue that that dog is not lucky. He's been through a whole lot of mess. But he is lucky, how do you know? <laughs> because he's got an owner that loves him just the way he is. He desperately wants him back. That's what redemption is all about. That's what God has done for us. That's what God wants us to do for one another. Before death, before it's too late, this life is all about redemption. It's all about bringing people back into a right relationship with God and redemption toward one another. Redemption is lovingly submitting ourselves to another person to meet their greatest need, and their greatest need is salvation. What does that look like? The redemption that Jesus is talking about here in John 15, 13. Greater love has no one than this than that one laid down his life for his friends. Are we willing to lay down our lives for our friends? Are we willing to tell them the truth? Well, I don't want to offend them. You don't have to offend them. But sometimes the gospel is offensive. Greater love has no one than this, that one laid down his life for his friends. All of life will soon be passed, right? Only what's done for Christ will last. And I'm, my hope and prayer is that we just have a deeper sense of who we are, where we're at, the fact that this life is short. We need to make the most of it. You know, there's only uh, one thing that we can do in heaven that we can't do here on earth. I should say there's, there's one thing on earth that we can't do in heaven. We can worship here on earth, but we can do a better job in heaven, right? We can fellowship here on earth, but we can do a better job fellowshipping in heaven. What's one thing we can't do in heaven? Evangelism. Are we sharing our faith? Are we being open and real and transparent and loving 
to speak the truth, but to speak it in love with those around us. The reality of who God is and what our condition truly is. And every day we thank the Lord for the position and the redemption that he's given to each and every one of us. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you and praise you for what you've done for us. But we don't say so and we don't believe it with a sense of complacency. But Lord, we, our, our desire is that it would stir us, motivate us out of a deep compassion for those around us that are desperately lost and in desperate need of a Savior. And so, Father, I pray that you'd, you'd wake us up. I'm talking about myself as well. That, Lord, we would be attuned to the reality of where people are heading. That we would lovingly confront people, exhort them, and encourage them to make that most important decision. And so, Father, I pray this week you would give us opportunities with family, with friends, with the people that we hang out with, that, Lord, we would somehow in our conversations draw people to the Savior, draw people to the reality of why they need a Savior and what they can be delivered from. And as, a, as hard of a conversation as that is, Lord, we pray that you would give us a boldness, fill us with your spirit, give us the words to say, not to destroy, but to build bridges of opportunity between us and other people around us that we love and that we care about. And so, Lord, just deepen our desire, our hunger to be all that you've called us to be in the short time that we have. Father, I thank you for this church family. I thank you, Lord, for all the, the people here that, that love you. And I pray that you would just continue to wrap your, your arms of love and guidance and direction for each and every person in this room, that you'd fill them with your spirit, cause them again to be more and more the kind of disciples, apprentices of Jesus Christ that you've called them to be. Father, we lift up our hearts and our lives to you. Our desire, Lord, is to love you with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and to draw others to the Savior. Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I will draw all men to myself. Father, we want to lift you up in thought, word, and deed. Father, may the words of our mouth, the meditations of our heart always be acceptable in your sight, O oh Lord, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. And it's in Jesus' precious name we pray and all God's children said, amen. amen.